Psalm 139, we've been studying the attributes of God. And the psalmist here, Psalm of David, he's looking at these wondrous attributes of an almighty, all-powerful God. But he's presenting them to us in a very deeply personal way. We looked in verses 1 through 6. One th I'm sorry, 1 through 8. Uh, no, 1 through 6. We saw God's omniscience, the God who knows everything. And we saw that he knows even our thoughts before they form in our brain. He knows our words before they form on our tongue. He knows every possible thing about us. That speaks to God's attribute of omniscience. He knows everything, not only actual but possible things. And then he goes on in verses 7 through 12 to speak of his omnipresence. That means he is present everywhere at all times in the same way. That doesn't mean that they take God and they spread him out like a spread or something. And the more you spread it, the thinner it gets. No. God is present at all times in every place. And he is because God is a person. And you can't divide a person up he is a, so if he's there that means he is present you have the entire strength the entire god there do you understand that i don't because i can't be here and at home at the same time i can't be here in someplace else at the same time but god can well tonight we're going to look in verses 13 to 18 he's going to take one more attribute of god and that is god's omnipotence God's omni, all, potence speaks of power. He is all powerful. And when you look at that attribute of God and look at it in light of what we are going through today in America, look at it in light of this election, not just what we do know, but look at it in light of what we don't know. When I look at it and what, we, what I have seen of things that are going on behind the scenes, things that you just can't put your finger on, but enough evidence comes out, you know it's happening. But you feel like in a machine and in a system that is so big, what can one person do? What can, and this is what people want you to feel, is that you are powerless. Well, I'm here to tell you that when you look at what we're going to look at tonight, if this doesn't give you chills up and down your spine and a sense that this thing is not out of control. This thing is very much, no matter what wicked man seems to think that he is doing, it is still in God's sovereign control. He knows all. He is omnipresent. That means he is present even where these shenanigans are going on. And then we know tonight that he is all-powerful. But he's going to speak to this, the, the power of God in a very personal way as it applies to him. So let's go back to Psalm 139. We'll pick up there with verse 13 and go down through verse 18 this evening. So read along with me, if you will. Verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, Thou hast, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth that, my soul knoweth right well. My substance has not hid from thee, was not hid from thee, when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than, than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Let's bow for prayer. Father, Tonight, as we look again at who you are, not just the God, the creator, and 
all those things that we know through Scripture. But Lord, as we look more closely and try to understand more intimately exactly who you are and the nature of the attributes that you possess, help us to know you better. And as a result, Lord, help us to live in a way that more and more will please and honor thee. Take your word, apply it to our hearts and our needs tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When you stop and think, when we get down to the, the final part of the passage, that God not only knows, he's not only present, but God is thinking of you. Now, does that, does that scare us a little bit? That, okay, I'm not lost in a crowd out there of billions of people. God knows me, he knows my needs, and he is thinking of me. And here's the, the concept, he's thinking of me continually. You know, there's one of our, one of the staff with NTCGS, he has a practice, he makes a list of the students and he prays for every student by name once a week. So once a week as he's going through his prayer time, he mentions that student to the Lord by name. Now imagine this. God knows all the billions of people that are on this planet. And he doesn't just come through once a week or a month or a year, if you have to go through all those names, and think of you for a split second. He is thinking of you continually. So as you think of this, let, let's t try to glean from the passage some of the understanding. And if it doesn't make you feel more at peace and easier to sleep tonight, then I'm not sure what will. Now I'll say this. If we are under conviction of God and we're out of God's will, knowing what we will learn tonight in light of what we've already learned, then that should scare us and it may keep us from sleeping until we confess and we renew our fellowship with the Lord. But omnipotence, the God who wondrously works. The God who wondrously works. So let's look, look here first of all in verse 13. We're just going to take it verse by verse and kind of break it down. When he says, for thou hast possessed my reins. The word possessed there is the word you created, you formed. It's, a word for, it's not a word for taking ownership, but in the sense that he made it. He possessed it that way. And then when he goes, for thou hast possessed my reins. These reins, by the way, are, are not the reins that you put on a horse or something like that. These are your kidneys. Okay, he's talking about the organ in the body. In Portuguese, the word is hens, R-I-N-S. And that's why when I was looking at this and then I went and checked it, and sure enough, it's, it's not the reins like you would take on a horse. It's your kidneys. Why is he talking about my kidneys? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. For thou hast put, you have formed or created me, and you covered me in my mother's womb. The word covered there is the word to knit. You're taking, you're knitting something together. You, you knit me, you covered me in my mother's womb. And what he's saying here, the idea here is that while you were yet unformed in your mother's womb, God knew you. God was aware of you. God was thinking about you. And that will go on even into more detail in just a few moments. But from conception, and the Bible tells us even before we were conceived in our mother's womb, God knew us. Now that phrase alone has implications that apply to us right now in the 2020 election platforms in 2020 United States of America. And in one of the greatest debates and protests that we had over the Supreme Court justice that was just seated. The, the word of God written thousands of years ago applies in 2020. You don't get more current than this. So God not only formed us, and when it says formed, it's not just saying, okay, I see that, you know, this couple, they conceived, they're having a baby. Okay, we've got one more born into the world. We've got to come up with a name for them. We've got to come up with a plan for them. They're going to have to grow, and they're going to have to get a career, and 
You know, we, man tries to plan and accommodate infrastructure to accommodate the increase in population. God is planning it from before conception. He is the giver of life. He is the one who forms us from our very intimate organs all the way out to the complete man. This, this, this term here of clothing, Job 10 verse 11, he describes it this way. He says, Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. He says, Lord, you made my skeleton. You then covered it with skin and flesh. And the, the psalmist uses this artistic terminology. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So it's a, it's a common term. And the use of this idea, Isaiah 44, 24 says, Thus saith the Lord, my Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Now I want you to stop and think of this. God does what he does alone. He does not need our help. He does not need a council. He does not need a cabinet. All that he has done, he does alone. He is self-sufficient. He is sovereign. He is all-powerful. And here's another phrase. He formed thee from the womb. When it says he formed thee, that speaks, that's a personal pronoun. Before you were ever born, you were a person in God's eyes. Well, this concept also of the speaking of the, why does he refer to kidneys this way? Well, look at, look at it this way. The kidneys, they kind of picture the, in some ways it's pictured as the seat of our emotions. In Psalm 73, 21, thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins, my kidneys. Proverbs 23, 16, Yea, my reins shall rejoice, my kidneys shall rejoice, when thy lips speak right things. Psalm 7, verses 9 and 10, this goes into the different concept, and that's of our character and our moral fiber. It speaks of that, that part of man. Psalm 7, 9 says, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just for the righteous. God trieth hearts and reigns. My defense is of God, that which saveth the upright heart. When it says he, he examines our lives, it says the heart and the kidneys. It's considered the innermost part. Psalm 26, 2, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Jeremiah eleven twenty. But, O Lord of hosts, that judgest righteously, that, that triest the reins or the kidneys and the heart, let me see thy vengeance on them, for unto thee have I revealed my cause. So we see that th this use throughout Scripture is used to speak of that innermost part of man where our emotions lie, where our responses lie, where our moral and, and fiber, moral fiber and character are seated. So God knows us in this way. When he says he possessed our, our reins, this is how he knows us. Well, then we come on down to verse 14, and he continues, what's this response to this? Lord, you formed me, you created me, you, you have possessed me from before the time I was even formed. He said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully, there's the word curiously. It, it, man cannot understand how it happens. Now, we have technology now. They can observe it from the very beginning on up, day by day, month by month until birth, but they still can't understand it. They cannot duplicate it. They can try to take parts of what God did and then, you know, come up with, what do they call them, clones? But they have to take what God did to do that. It is God who gives and forms life. So he says, my response is, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous, or the word awesome. 
Now, we, we hear everybody saying, awesome, you know. Somebody would come and ask you something. Oh, did you get this? Yeah, I got it. Awesome. What is awesome about that? I got a piece of paper. I got this or I got... It's not all, but we have diminished what awesome means and we have failed to recognize what awesomeness truly is. And that is what God does. And the psalmist says, and that my soul knoweth right well. You know, over the years we have attempted to take the scriptures out of everyday life, out of schools, government. We're trying slowly to remove Christianity and the influence of a biblical preaching church out of the community center. And if we can take the knowledge of God and who God is and what God does, then all of a sudden you're going to have a nation that once was a God-fearing nation when it was established, and you will indoctrinate. And all it, all it takes is, to, you don't have to force them to believe these other things. Just take God out, and those other will happen naturally. The devil will bring the lie. And our nation is so divided today. And one of the reasons we believe it's okay to do the things we do and act the way we act is because we don't believe there's a God, truly. Now these are religious people that say, we go to church. But they don't believe God is the giver and therefore God is the only one who is the taker of life. If they believe that God of the Bible was true, one of the top platforms on one side of the thing would not be the destruction of this world. Because it's coming whether, no matter what we do. But God is the one that's going to do it, not man. But the reason we fear global warming and the environmental issues, and the reason we have the arrogance to think we can do something about it in the, on, the, on the large scale of things, is because we don't believe in creation in this nation anymore. We don't believe that God is sovereign. We don't believe God is all powerful. But the psalmist, he said, I know that well. That's why I asked you tonight, do you believe that verse, the, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? Do you believe that? Because if you do, pray. Don't complain, pray. Because God can change the course of a nation, the heart of a king. He can change the course of history based on the prayers of righteous people. Israel tried the complaining route and murmuring, didn't they? How, how did that go? I don't remember a single time that God didn't come away angry. And generally, he punished them for it. But when we respond by recognizing, no matter the circumstances, how God is marvelous and that he is at work and we entrust things to him, I suspect we will have a different outlook and there will be a different outcome to these circumstances. He goes on in verse 15, after that break showing his response to that concept in verse 13, he goes on to expand it further. He says, my substance, and by substance he means my whole physical being, not just the bones and the organs and the skin and the flesh, but it's just the, the, the whole person of who I will become. The substance was not hid from thee. You know, that it's, it's in contrast to what we saw of God's omnipresence. He said, where shall I go from your spirit? Shall I ascend into heaven? Well, Lord, you're there. If I descend into Sheol or Hades, you're there. If I go as far as I can, east or west, Lord, you're going to be there too. So physically, there's a, if I even go back to the mother's womb before I was ever formed, Lord, my entire person, my entire being is not hid from you. God knows it. From the beginning, before... And yet God knows perfectly. Look at, look at the next phrase. My substance was not hid from, from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. When I was made in secret. This means when my father and my mother, hidden from human eyes, they conceived me, I was not hidden from you, Lord. 
God knew all that was taking place. And then he says, and curiously wrought. The, the word curiously wrought is the word I was embroidered. So he was knit up there in verse 13, and now he is embroidered here in verse 16 or 15. You see the artistic language. He, he's visualizing that his life is this tapestry that God himself is weaving, he is knitting, he's embroidering. In the lowest parts of the earth. And that, that is an expression used in poetry for the womb. God, you're doing all these things. And when you stop and think of the intricate detail that God has in forming who you and I will become. It is, it is an amazing thought. And then it goes on to, to say something else in verse 16. And this, this goes beyond birth. To our entire life, including death. It says, Thine eyes did see my substance being yet unperfect. And in the book of in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Okay, Lord, before I was conceived, before that embryo began to grow and the bone structure began to form, the flesh, the skin, and all the different organs formed over those nine months. Lord, you already knew. You could see my substance, a full-grown man. You knew the day I would be born. You knew what my stature would be. You knew the number of hairs on my head and for how long. And Lord, you knew when I would die. You knew me completely when I was yet unperfect, incomplete. And look at this next phrase, and in thy book. That means in your plan, Lord. You say, you mean God has a plan for me? He didn't just start this design, this original Adam, you know, and then set up the assembly line like we do at the Ford or Chevy Motor Plants and we start assembling, you know, just bring in all the same parts, put them all in the same order, and you should have a running car the same way at the end. No. Each and every one of us, including twins and triplets and quadruplets, they're uniquely and wonderfully made, and God has a plan for every last one of them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a God that has that kind of knowledge and the ability to process that many different people, that many different things? It says, in thy book, all my members were written. And Lord, in your book, all these things were written when? When in continuous, they were, they were continually being fashioned. And as yet, there were none of them. None of them were complete, but yet you knew it all from when they would be complete, how they would be complete, and for how long they would be complete. Now, if you understand this concept, the concept that we come to later in scriptures when it tells us there in the book of Revelation that your name and my name who know the Lord Jesus Christ was written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Say, how in the world could the Lord put my name in the Lamb's book of life, saying, I am a child of God, redeemed by the Lamb, before I was ever born? Before I ever made a choice? Before I ever heard the gospel? How could God know this? I hate to tell you this, but God not only knew that, He knew how many cells you would have in your body. Even the scientists can't fully count all that. Thine eyes did see my substance. And God can see your substance today, folks. He, he knows the battles we face. You know, Brother Darren Irvin that visits with us, he was sharing this morning that his mother, his stepmom, has, she's 96 in a nursing home in Withville, and she is, she's been diagnosed with the coronavirus as well. Does God know about these people? Yes, he does. He knows about the baby that seems like it's not that significant to anybody but his parents and grandparents at that point in life. He, he can't take care of himself, let alone produce anything 
effective or productive in this life yet. But God knows. And God sees the substance. And that elderly person that seemingly they don't have that much life left. They may be facing diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, and other things. And does God know about them? He knows. He knows the subject. He knows the pain. He knows all they're going through. And that's not all. He cares. When you stop and think of that, it, it should bring us to a certain understanding of the Lord. Well, the Bible speaks of this expression, in thy book or in thy plan, all these things are written. As you look at these different passages, they refer in one sense to creation. God not only planned, he designed you this way. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man did become a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. This is, that word is used in this passage, again, of God's plan. Amos chapter 4, verse 13, For lo, he formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness, and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. And on and on. And then another way in which it is used in 2 Kings 19, 25, is in the sense of God's planning for our lives. Not only did he create us according to his plan, he plans our lives out for us, our birth, our life, and even our death and all that's in between. So when we ask that question, it's often asked of men, say, God, where are you when it hurts? Well, where is he? Well, verses 7 through 12 tell us that. He's there. He's the God who is there. Lord, but you don't understand my situation. Well, verses 1 through 6 tell us that. He's the God who knows all. So, well, Lord, I, I suspect that in the hearts of some of these enemies that we have, that they are conniving, they're conspiring against me. Well, God knows their thoughts before they are formed. He knows their words before they're spoken. And now we see that his works, he has a plan for you and he is sovereign over you and he is going to accomplish what he wants through you. The point is we need to be on that side and we need to be obedient. Well, verse 17 brings us to kind of a, a concluding thought here just before he makes a final and profound statement. He says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. You're the God who is omniscient. You're the God who is omnipresent. You have this entire universe, not only the earth, but all of space and all the universe to control. And yet, you thought of me. David, the psalmist. In one sense, yes, a man after God's own heart, but he, was, he could also be a perverse man, couldn't he? He was tempted, and he, was, he fell into temptation, and he, he pursued adultery, and he had the woman's husband killed in battle. And yet God forgave him. He was used greatly of the Lord. And he's sitting here, and he's looking at this, and he says, Lord... You thought about me. And look at this. Oh God, how great is the sum of them. They are in the, the, the idea here is they're countless. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. And scripture speaks that more than the sand of the sea and more than the hairs on your head. It, this is an idea that there's no way I can number the number of thoughts God had toward us. Do you know that listening to different ones, I, I was listening to different authors who have become very famous. 
But their goal was this, I'm going to write a book, but they hope and pray and they try to work through channels and people who know people who know the key people so that their manuscript can get before them so that it can then be published and then become, they can become a famous author. They just have to pray. If I can only become a speck on their radar and they can become aware of me maybe in just a conversation or this, maybe I have a chance. And what's worse is, I don't think it's 9 out of 10 never make it. I think it's 99 out of 100 will never make it. The same is true of those who want to become a Hollywood star. Or they want to be a famous sports uh, idol in football or baseball or basketball. Oh, if only that recruiter could be aware of me. But when you think of that and how some of them were spotted or discovered and how they became in their field a success story. And you come to this passage and here the God of all the universe, he says, not only does he know about us, he thinks about us. And the number of thoughts he has toward us are countless. Is it amazing to you? God cares. He knows we're, we're, we're having to deal with these masks. He knows what our oxygen level is in every one of our cases while we're dealing with these masks. He's thinking, continuing. Here's another expression that is very profound. Look at the end of verse 18. When I awake, I am still with thee. You know that prayer that children have been taught to pray over the years? Now I lay me down to sleep. I ask the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I ask the Lord my soul to take. And then, you know, they're saying, Lord, while I sleep, look after me. Now, here's the way the psalmist is putting this. Lord, when I'm awake... You are thinking, your thoughts are toward me, but then I can go to sleep with confidence knowing that your thoughts are toward me, and when I wake, I am still on your mind. Even while I'm out of it, I'm asleep, I'm unconscious, so to speak. You never sleep, you never slumber, and you never become unaware or unconcerned or uninterested in what is transpiring in my life. Now, like I said, if that doesn't give you chills, I don't know what does. That means I can lay down with confidence, regardless of whether or not they have certified this election, regardless of not who's going to get in that White House. And I will tell you that sometimes when I stop and think about it from a human standpoint, from this one human being who really is in no place to do very much about it, I think of the progress that has been made toward Israel. There's no interest to pursue that in the next agenda. In fact, any credit that might have gone to the, the predecessor, they don't want that, so that's going to be canceled. The progress made towards lawfulness, the progress that has been made towards Christian liberties and specifically churches in this nation, many of those are going to be written off the books. And so many other things. The, the progress in the area of the concept of right to life. The concept of having some more conservative judges on the Supreme Court. And the danger there will be of reversing some of that through other measures. I sit there and think, I said, Lord, what is happening to our country? This is not just a small election. When you think of all that could be done in four years. But when I stop and think, and the more I try to, and the devil, he'll try to put that panic and discouragement there and say, you may as well give up. You may as well not fight again. Well, I can lay down with confidence knowing that he knows, he cares. He's the God who knows all. He is the God who is present everywhere. And he is the God. If he can form me in my mother's womb. And he can clothe me with, with flesh and with skin. And he can know the substance of my being from before I'm formed. 
and his thoughts are continually day and night toward me. I can go to bed with confidence. And if I do wake up in the morning, the Lord hasn't returned, or the Lord hasn't taken me home, I can wake up with the confidence that he will give me the grace for that day. And that he will use me in that day if I will be available to him. Now let me make one more application in this passage. And that is, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is very relevant to the day and time we live in. has been for several years. But when it says here in, in Psalm 139, 13 and following, but it said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It says, before I was formed. You knew me. In, in Habakkuk 2, verse 18, What profit is the graveth, graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image of, of, and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? And the concept there is it goes along with Isaiah 45, 9, which is, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say unto him that fashioneth it, fashioneth it, What makest thou, or thy work, or hath no hands? In other words, who is the clay to question the potter? Who are we as God's creation to question our creator? When Job did this, what did God say? He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I created everything? I didn't need your counsel or your advice then, and I don't need it now. But here's what happens. In the day we live, this abortion on demand concept, it comes from not only evolution, the concept that man is not made by God in the image of God, and God is the one who gives life, and God rightfully is the only one who can take life. God knows us before we're conceived. That eliminates this idea that, okay, abortion in the first trimester is okay because it's not a life yet. Folks, it was a life before conception occurred. Because God knows all, and he planned it all from the beginning. So what, what position should we as Christians take on this? Well, there's, there's no, and then they, they started saying, well, we can now do abortions not just the first trimester, but also up to the second trimester, up to six months, because yet it's not a viable fetus is the term they use. And now they've gone all the way up to nine months. Partial birth abortions, and now, of course, our governor promoting post-birth abortions and they don't call it anymore abortions that it's not a life what they say is it's a woman's health issue even if it means it's her mental health she does not want that baby and therefore it's an issue of mental health and therefore it is right for her to choose on her authority alone whether that baby lives or dies when you know that the God of this universe created that baby, regardless of how it was conceived, whether morally or immorally, the God of the universe, he created that, that life. So to take that life, it intrudes upon the sovereignty. Now understand what I'm saying here. It does not succeed. It attempts to intrude upon the sovereignty of God. It attempts to intrude upon the creation of God, it attempts to rebel against the plan of God, and it tries to steal what belongs to God. Now, you want to know what I believe? And I, I think there's a scriptural basis for this. I believe that the, the devil himself and all of these godless people who claim to be more scientific, more wise in the ways, who have promoted abortion, they have done as much to populate heaven as anything I know. Because I firmly believe that 
A child who dies before knowing, before understanding right and wrong, and being able to choose between right and wrong, I believe when that child dies, they go to heaven. And that being the case, if God knew each one of these embryos, or this fetus as they like to call it, before they were ever formed, and man has sought to destroy that life, God knew it. None of this was a surprise to him, and though he's allowed it, there are going to be a lot of family reunions in heaven with children people have never known. There are going to be a lot of people that are going to have a lot to answer for. Those who do know the Lord, and they do get their... One thing we know about heaven, we don't have a sin nature when we get there as believers, and there will not be bitterness and all, but imagine that reunion of those lives. And I firmly believe that's what it's going to be. But where do we stand? Is it important to stand with this understanding that we have of God, that he is the giver of life and he is the taker of life? And if he knew us then, are we going to say that's not a life? It gives us something to think about, doesn't it? He's the God who knows all, verses 1 to 6. He's the God who is everywhere, verses 7 to 12. And he is the God who does all, verses 13 to 18. And we'll close it out. It's going to, it has some interesting applications to these truths in verses 19 to 24. We'll look at that next time. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to the realization that we don't know what awesome truly is. We use the word today for such mundane and daily things and we lose the, the marvel and the wonder of what is truly awesome. But Lord, when we stop and understand that you knew every single thing about us before we were ever conceived, and that Lord, now your thoughts are toward us, thoughts too numerous for us to even number. And no matter where we are in this life, no matter how lost we may seem to be in the crowd and in the shuffle, or how buried we may feel under trials and tribulations, you know where we are. You know what we're going through, and your thoughts are toward us. And we can lay down with confidence at night, and we can sleep, knowing that when we wake up, we'll still be with you. We will still be on your mind. While we do not comprehend this, Lord, it is indeed wonderful and awesome and incomprehensible to us. We thank you and praise you for that truth. Help us, Lord, to live accordingly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.